If you want to solve your hair loss, you have to know what's causing it. And that means you have to get your diagnosis correct. If you don't do this right, you will not pursue the right treatments. You will pursue things that don't target your causes of hair loss. You will get worse outcomes. And five years down the line, you'll wonder, why aren't these things working for me? Time is of the essence. We want to put you in the best possible position for success, which is why we're making this video about diagnosing hair loss types. And on top of that, we spent the last four months building you a free interactive guide that lets you see how each of these hair loss disorders advance across men, across women, and across stages of their development. Not just at the level of presentation, but underneath the hood. What exactly is going on at the level of the hair follicle? And how clinicians will use these things and these clues in scalp biopsies and in presentations to make that diagnosis for you. I hope this video is helpful and I hope that it allows you to unlock a new level of regrowth. This is Rob from Perfect Hair Health and in this video, we are going to dive into the four major kinds of hair loss. These kinds constitute about 95% of all hair loss diagnoses, and we're gonna cover their presentations, their prevalence, and their suspected causes. We'll also give you something for free that we've worked really hard to build over the last few months. I'm gonna link it below. The reason we built this is to show you just how similar some hair loss types can look, especially at their earliest of stages. And because of that, why so many misdiagnoses actually happen. That is a huge problem because it actually ends up delaying people from getting the best of the best treatments and it worsens their hair growth outcomes. So by having this video, by having this guide, my hope is that you're able to minimize the possibility of a misdiagnosis happening to you. Without further ado, let's dive into these hair loss types and we will start with the first major hair loss type, androgenic alopecia. Androgenic alopecia is also called male and female pattern hair loss. This is the most common kind of hair loss for which people seek treatment. And it's so prevalent that you generally can't walk down a city block without spotting somebody with the condition. It typically starts after puberty. And for men, it usually starts as temple recession or maybe the formation of a bald spot. In women, it's generally thinning diffusely throughout the top of the scalp. It's chronic, it's progressive, so without treatment, it typically worsens, and usually at a rate of a 5% loss in hair volume per year, which is why it often takes decades for somebody to progress to a fully slick bald scalp. And it's also why some studies show that given the prevalence of androgenic alopecia, if you live long enough, the odds of it affecting you is close to 100%. According to the best research so far, androgenic alopecia is caused by interactions between our genes and the hormone dihydrotestosterone, or DHT. If you want to dive deeper into this, check out our video on the primary versus secondary factors of hair loss. Check out our free resource exploring the science behind each of these factors. I will link that below. So how do you know if you have androgenic alopecia? It's simple, go to a dermatologist, get a diagnosis. That's really the only way to know. And it applies to all hair loss types discussed in this video. But if you don't have access to a good dermatologist or maybe you're interested in some at-home tests, you can ask yourself the following questions. Does hair loss run in your family? Did your hair loss start any time after puberty? Is your hair loss progressively getting worse, typically over a series of years? Does it follow any of these patterns? If the answers to any of these questions is yes, your odds of an androgenic alopecia diagnosis just increased. Next, go into the shower and shampoo your hair. All the strands that fall out, stick those against the wall and suction them flat with water. Do some of the hairs that shed look thicker and some of the hairs look thinner? If the answer is yes, that's another indication of androgenic alopecia because a hallmark characteristic of this condition is something known as hair follicle miniaturization. This is where the individual strands of hair get thinner and thinner and thinner over time until eventually they're so thin you can barely see them at all. The best treatment targets for androgenic alopecia involve lowering the hormone DHT, especially in the scalp. When you do this to a therapeutic level, you can see a slowing, stopping, or partial reversal of hair loss in about 80 to 90% of men. There are also other treatment targets that involve inflammation, microcirculation, microorganisms, you name it. These treatment targets will absolutely work for some people. But the biggest and most consistent hair gains will come from targeting that hormone, DHT. Again, for more information on this, check out our video on how to fix hair loss in men, watch our video uncovering the primary versus secondary factors in androgenic alopecia. 
The next type of hair loss is called telogen effluvium. You can think of telogen effluvium almost as a hair cycling disorder. For reference, our hair is constantly going through a cycle of growing and then resting and then shedding and repeating over and over and over across our lifetime. In a healthy scalp, most hairs grow for two to seven years, at which point they shed, the follicle degenerates, and a new follicle regenerates to take its place. And then the cycle repeats. At any given time, it's normal for 10 to 15% of our hairs to be in that shedding stage. And that is why we can lose up to 150 hairs every day, even without a hair loss problem. Those hairs are always getting replaced. Now, telogen effluvium is when some sort of event disrupts our hair cycle. And in some cases causes too many hairs to shed out ahead of schedule. And that leaves a gap between when those hairs fall out and when those new hairs are supposed to regenerate and grow in to take their place. If some sort of pathological event causes our hair shedding rates to exceed 15 to 20%, we now technically have telogen effluvium. And shedding from telogen effluvium usually happens in an even pattern, distributed evenly, diffusely across the scalp. So what sort of events can cause telogen effluvium? The short answer is a ton. First, you can have mild cases of telogen effluvium, such as seasonal hair shedding. This is where in the Northern Hemisphere, we tend to notice slight upticks to hair shedding starting in February and also at the end of July and August. This is due to changes in our circadian rhythm and our exposure to sunlight. These cases of telogen effluvium, they're so mild that for the average person, you'd never even notice them, aside from maybe a little bit more hair on your pillow. In fact, seasonal hair shedding is what technically makes telogen effluvium the most common kind of hair loss in the world. We all go through it, once, sometimes twice a year. But most of those cases are subclinical, meaning that we're not gonna be seeking treatment for it because we barely notice it at all. So that's on the subtler side. On the more severe side of things, when hair shedding rates can climb above 30%, 40%, 50%, you can have telogen effluvium caused by acute stressors. We're talking physical trauma, childbirth, psychological trauma, severe flus, rapid weight loss, sometimes even bad reactions to medications. And then you can have chronic cases of telogen effluvium ones that are triggered by deficiencies in iron or vitamin D or B vitamins like biotin, or maybe even nutrient surpluses in selenium, or perhaps from conditions like hypothyroidism or heavy metal toxicities or gut dysbiosis, things that happen chronically, persistently, and so the shedding rates are always dysregulated. The good news is, in most cases of telogen effluvium, the condition is 100% reversible. So unlike androgenic alopecia, which is chronic and progressive, if you identify what's causing your stressor, you fix it, then in three to eight months time, your hair cycle normalizes, you can fully reverse this condition, and in one to two years, it's like you never had a hair loss problem to begin with. However, there is a catch. People can have multiple hair loss disorders simultaneously. For instance, telogen effluvium and androgenic alopecia. So say that you're somebody who has no noticeable hair loss and you decide, I wanna lose weight. So you do a crash diet and in doing that, you end up with a protein deficiency. You end up developing some nutrient deficiencies and you also go hypothyroid. And resultantly, you end up experiencing a massive, albeit temporary, telogen effluvium shed. Now consider that this happens and you don't have any genetic risk factors for androgenic alopecia. In three to eight months time, after you fix those deficiencies, your hair cycle will normalize, your hair will start to come back, and one to two years down the road, it's like you've got a full head of hair again. But say that same scenario happens, but you have a genetic predisposition for androgenic alopecia. Now, when your hair starts to recover from that telogen effluvium shed, the strands of hair will come back, albeit thinner than the last hair cycle. This is because in androgenic alopecia, hair follicle miniaturization occurs in between hair cycles, after a hair sheds, and when a new hair follicle is forming to take its place. So any hair loss disorder that revs up your rates of hair shedding, that's going to accelerate miniaturization in androgenic alopecia. It's going to accelerate the onset of this condition. This is what's known as telogen effluvium unmasking androgenic alopecia. It's well documented, and this situation, it happens frequently and it causes two big problems. The first is that people who undergo this 
will confuse or conflate hair loss cause and effect. So people with both types of hair loss will think correctly that, wow, I'm losing hair because I just went through a super stressful divorce, or I have a nutrient deficiency, or maybe I'm hypothyroid. But then they'll correct those things, or they'll give enough time away from the stressful events, and their hair will start to grow back, but it's less dense, it's thinner. And over time, they're noticing, hey, it's worsening. That's because when those hairs came back, they came in miniaturized because that genetic predisposition for androgenic alopecia was present. And so what caused your initial shedding at the outset is now feeding into another hair loss disorder. In other words, what caused your hair loss one year ago is now not what's causing it today. And if you don't know this, then you continue risking to try to treat your hair loss as just telogen effluvium when that's no longer what's causing it, so your hair loss will continue to get worse until you shift your treatment targets. The second problem is the concern of a hair loss misdiagnosis. Check out the interactive guide that I mentioned earlier on these hair loss disorders, and you'll notice something fascinating. In men, the earliest stages of androgenic alopecia can look identical to the earliest stages of telogen effluvium, or a mild telogen effluvium shed. And in women, Pattern hair loss across all stages can actually look nearly identical to telogen effluvium. What separates these two hair loss disorders is the presence or the absence of hair follicle miniaturization, which is not always detectable unless somebody looks at your scalp with a micro-zoomed device. This is precisely why researchers like Dr. Jeffrey Donovan will talk about how a misdiagnosis of telogen effluvium is so common for people who really just have early stage androgenic alopecia. And that misdiagnosis might sound small, but the consequence is big. It delays your treatment for androgenic alopecia. So, be aware of this, and when you go to see your dermatologist, make sure that they review your entire medical history, your family history of hair loss, and make sure they actually examine your scalp when assessing your hair loss case. Otherwise, you might end up in one of these exact situations that we want you to avoid. The next type of hair loss is alopecia areata. This is a kind of hair loss that affects 2% of people over a lifetime. It's linked to something known as autoimmunity, where our immune system begins to confuse our own tissues as a threat, and in doing so, we'll start to attack them. In the case of alopecia areata, this collapse of immune privilege happens at the level of the hair follicle, which then leads to hair loss. In a lot of cases, alopecia areata will onset rapidly in a matter of weeks to months. And the hair loss typically occurs in random patches, kind of looking like little circles that are irregularly placed along the scalp. Some people might also experience it as hair loss behind the ears. And in some situations, not all, alopecia areata can also occur slowly, progressively, and evenly distributed across the entire scalp it can mask as diffuse thinning from androgenic alopecia. This is known as alopecia areata incognita, or diffuse alopecia areata. And in an upcoming video, we are going to feature a member story of someone from our community who was misdiagnosed as having androgenic alopecia by five dermatologists over a 10-year period, including a transplant surgeon. And he actually had alopecia areata incognita, and consequently missed out on a decade of proper treatment before finally finding a regimen that worked for him. For now, I wanna stress this, just know that alopecia areata is rare, and these edge cases that I'm talking about are even rarer. They won't apply to most people watching this video. So how do you identify alopecia areata? Look for fast onsetting hair loss in irregular patches, that's one clue. At a microscopic level, you can also look for hairs that may be thin within the same hair cycle. So the tip of the hair is gonna be thicker than the root of the hair. These are what are known as exclamation mark hairs, and they're one characteristic that makes the miniaturization in alopecia areata unique from that in androgenic alopecia. Finally, treatments for alopecia areata almost always involve targeting the immune system. There are actually two FDA-approved options, both of which are known as Janus kinase or JAK inhibitors. And there are also corticosteroid shampoos, topicals, and injections. People use these things with varying degrees of success. The treatments are getting better and better and better with time. In addition, some members of our community have seen really impressive hair regrowth after making massive overhauls to their diets, their lifestyles, their environments, because after all, these factors 
do also influence autoimmunity, and they can play a role in triggering those reactions that then lead to immune privilege collapse at the hair follicle. There's even preliminary evidence to suggest that our gut microbiome could play a role in alopecia areata. We'll make more videos about that in the future. The last common type of hair loss that we're gonna discuss are scarring alopecias. Scarring alopecias tend to affect women more than they do men. And they often account for about seven to 10% of hair loss diagnoses by dermatologists. They're also really hard to identify because again, at their earliest of stages, they can look just like androgenic alopecia or other hair loss types. I mean, see this example of a scarring alopecia masking as androgenic alopecia. Or take this example of a member of ours who was told multiple times he only had androgenic alopecia when a scalp biopsy revealed he actually had androgenic alopecia alongside diffuse lichen planopolaris, a scarring disorder. For the male model in our interactive guide, we actually used lichen planopolaris so that you could see its progression over a series of stages. And then there are other kinds of scarring alopecias that might present in patches or as evenly distributed hairband recession as in the case of frontal fibrosing alopecia, which is the female model that we used in our guide. And then there's zigzag scarring that you can see in traction alopecia due to ponytails that are pulled too tight for too long over too many years. So you can kind of see where I'm going with this. There are dozens of kinds of scarring alopecias and their range of causes and presentations, it's massive. But at a high level, these things are believed to be caused by interactions between our genes, our hormones, and environmental factors. They've also been linked to bacterial infections, stress, even certain cosmetic products like sunscreens applied to our foreheads. Unfortunately, scarring alopecias are relatively understudied compared to other hair loss types. And so there's just still a ton that we don't know. So if you zoom out, how might you identify one? First, Many scarring alopecias actually accompany physical scalp pain. So people will report that the roots of the hairs are hurting or maybe combing the hair hurts or feel sensitive to the touch. The scalp itself can also sometimes look red or inflamed. There can also be intense itching or a burning sensation that somebody describes during periods of activity. And sometimes people will also report none of these things. It can be really tricky to know. So how would you know with certainty? Well. If the presentation isn't incredibly obvious, like with frontal fibrosing alopecia, typically a diagnosis is done through a scalp biopsy because a scalp biopsy will give a clinician a chance to look under the hood at what's going on with your hair at a microscopic level. With scarring alopecias, they're often looking at one major thing, your sebaceous glands, the thing that produces scalp oils for your hair. In androgenic alopecia, sebaceous glands are either unaffected or they get a little bit larger. In scarring alopecias, the inflammation underneath the skin, it's so insidious, it's so widespread, that oftentimes the sebaceous gland is completely destroyed. That's one of this hair loss disorder's key hallmarks, the absence or the destruction of the sebaceous gland. And that's how people diagnose them and you can see that reflected inside of our interactive guide. Just watch at how these things progress. Look at the magnitude of scarring in a scarring alopecia, and then look at the magnitude of scarring across androgenic alopecia. These things look very different at a microscopic level. Once again, alopecia areata, scarring alopecias, these things do happen. Some people watching this video will have them, but they're rarer than telogen effluvium and androgenic alopecia. So most people watching this video will be facing those things, not alopecia areata, not scarring alopecias. Nonetheless, for those who suspect a scarring alopecia, time is absolutely of the essence, which is why you should go to a dermatologist as soon as possible for a diagnosis. Not just for these hair loss types, but really for any hair loss type. That way you can fast track yourself to reliable treatments. And by the way, we are going to have a video on how to dominate your dermatology appointment very soon because I'm also well aware of the number of people who go into these appointments, feel like the service was terrible, that they got no diagnosis whatsoever, and walk out feeling as though they just blew $300 for zero advice. In the meantime, check out our free resource to get a better understanding of each of these hair loss types, what they are, what causes them, their presentations, how they advance, and how they differ in presentation across men and women at both 
a microscopic level and a macroscopic level. Again, the first step in solving hair loss is identifying what's causing it. And that means diagnosing yourself properly, which is an absolute must. So I hope this video helps. We're gonna have more videos soon. And thank you again for watching.